Hello, 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 everyone. Oh. There she is. Look at us having our technical issues. Hello. <laughs> I was like, where am I? You're here. <laughs> Both here. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to Creative Custody. Real stories, real solutions, real tech problems at your weekly dose of empowerment and practical guidance. Yes. I am Renee Rodriguez, the creator of Blueprint. And I am Atra Tarva, an IFS trained trauma recovery coach. And uh, every week we come here because we understand there are unique challenges that protective parents face in the courtroom. And the, the mission of Renee and I is to equip you with the strategic thinking and emotional support that parents need to navigate this difficult journey with strength and resilience. So every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, we're going to go live on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, bringing you real stories. You're going to get inspiration and insight from stories about courageous parents who have walked in your shoes and emerged victorious in big ways and small, and expert advice. Get practical strategies from us to help you advocate for your children and manage your trauma as you go through your custody case. Yeah. So let's dive in. We are not going to be giving legal advice. We're not going to be giving therapy. Just a reminder. Yes. And if you're feeling triggered, we want you to take care of yourself. So step away and come back. Join us in the comments. You know, last week we tackled the nerve wracking but important first meeting with a guardian ad litem or GAL. And we talked about the different things that that might be depending on your jurisdiction. It might not be called a GAL. It might be an AFC or a BIA or a child attorney or an FOC or a bunch of other sort of string of letters. But these are the people who represent the children in your children's voice. And we talked about preparation, making a good impression, and understanding this person's role. Yeah. So this week, what we're going to do is we're going to dive deeper into a common concern that arises after that first meeting, which is we talked about it just a little bit last week, but, but, but it's overcoming potential bias in the GAL's perspective. Yeah. Yeah, because it's it's very natural to wonder if the GAL might be favoring your co-parent. After all, they are meeting with both sides. They are gathering information and trying to make a decision. Yeah, and bias is unconscious prejudice, right? That's the thing. So we all have it, and the GAL is no different. There are no exception to them. So they might be influenced by gender roles. They might be influenced by socioeconomic background, their own personal experiences race, there's unconscious biases that can show up. Absolutely. And the key is to mm -hmm. acknowledge this reality and approach the situation strategically. So Renee, how do we overcome potential bias, whether conscious or unconscious, and advocate effectively for our kids? Well, yeah, there's a lot of different ways. I think we can talk about sort of, uh, let's talk about five, you know, key ways to do that. Um, I think the first thing is to focus on on facts and not emotions. Parents are so eager to come in and tell the story, especially I find in boost. Um, so we're going to see through through him. They're going to see what he's really like. So they need that story. But in reality, um, you want to, you want to make sure you're presenting yourself with composure and clarity to be even killed and to just stick to the facts, the provable. I have evidence for this facts about your situation and stick to your children's needs. Always be child led. Yeah. And when we're, when we're that way, we talked about this before and we say this over and over again, it's really, it's more challenging um, to do than to say, right? But avoid getting emotional or bad mouthing your ex. Focus on solutions and how your approach benefits your children's well being. We touched on this a little bit last week, but really understanding that focusing on your child and not in a I do everything sort of way and that person does nothing, more of this is what, you know, we, my child likes this, my child does this, my child and I went here yeah. in a very uh, non-confrontational, avoid getting emotional sort of way. Yeah, I think imagine the GL is a judge of facts, not emotions. You want to build a strong case highlighted on verifiable information. Yeah, that's really, really important because 
oftentimes what can happen is we see our parents really wanting to befriend, you know, the GAL, wanting somebody to come on their side, hear my story, recognize my plight, and taking out of the facts and really getting into sort of this heart situation. And it is heart wrenching. We acknowledge that, but staying really, really into that headspace of these are the facts of, of what's occurring and sort of an observation mode. And ob your observer part is really, really helpful in these situations. And we want you to highlight your strengths as well. Number two, we want you to really highlight your strengths. Yep. We don't want you to be shy, you know, showcase your parenting skills and your ability to provide that safe and loving environment for your children. Any parts that hold compassion in your system. These are, this is a great time for those parts to shine. And I think that involves providing examples of, you know, uh, a parent's involvement. You know, what I'm always telling clients is how are you involved in their lives, their activities, and just dedication to the children's well-being? Yeah, that could be like when we uh, have uh, examples of projects that they've done, could be school records, um, could be doctor's appointments, um, just documenting the consistent routine that you have with your kids. It's all yeah. very helpful. Yeah. Those organizing parts really shine in this area too. And I think that takes us to number uh, three, sort of main area, which is too, that you you do need to be prepared to address concerns though. Like the, the GAL might have questions or concerns raised by your ex at some point. And that's that's normal. Yeah, we tell people to be calm and to address them calmly and rationally with evidence to back up the claims. But I mean, what do you see typically, Renee? I know you've talked about this a lot and I just want to say, I just want to ask you like when, when they're not calm and they are focused on the ex solely and not focused on them, what is some of the strategy advice that you give in those moments? So it no. is important to address concerns. Yeah. I mean, the, the GEL might have questions or concerns raised by your ex. That's normal. Yeah. It's really hard to not go into a defensive mode when the GAL brings up concerns that the ex has, because automatically there's these parts that think, oh, now you're saying I'm a bad mom. And I just wanted to, you know, we can say to be prepared and to address those things calmly and rationally and have evidence to back up your claims. But how do you do that without being defensive too? Yeah, I think you have to anticipate the potential concerns and have that documentation ready, like communication records that disprove their allegations or highlighting how you're actually being collaborative with them. And I think, you know, one of the tools that we use is um, we have, so here's what we do. We have our our clients um, send um, a bi-weekly report to the guardian ad litem. Um, and so, and that's something I'll go into a little bit more shortly, but it's there that you can also include evidence because what we don't want to do is just keep constantly sending them these big batches of evidence, um, which really does lead to the fourth thing, which is to document everything. everything. And um, yeah, absolutely everything, everything. Yeah, that strategy is crucial. And I know we have parts that get really exhausted that go, oh, I got to do this again. I got to do this again. And the answer is always yes. And yes, it is exhausting. And yes, why do I have to do that? And yes, this is frustrating. But you are fighting for your kids and for the life of safety for your kids. So it's a really important to keep a detailed record of interactions with, with the children, of interactions with the ex, of interactions with the GAL. Those are all really important things to do. And the documentation can be helpful too if there's any discrepancies later. I love that you said, you know, that it's exhausting. This is, I, you know, what I see a lot on the internet right now, there's this trend toward sort of saying to, you know, abuse victims to protective mothers, you know, I know it's exhausting. Everybody who's telling you to document everything, don't listen to them, it's too much, or there's not really a need for it, or, you know, just do this, just do that. And I have to say, as someone who is, uh, you know, working with so many clients at any given time, have worked with so many clients, there's one thing I always tell my clients is do not buy into any of that. Yes, absolutely. You are documenting everything. As long as you're in an active custody case, 
I'm sorry right. to say you really are documenting everything. You're documenting the stuff that's going on. You're also documenting the stuff that you're doing right. And look, you're not going to use hardly any of it. But the problem I see is when people don't document something and then they don't have anything to show what they're trying to argue or what they're trying to say is not true about themselves. And so it is our clients who are all kind of like, yes, I am absolutely documenting everything. It's exhausting. It's hard. It doesn't even feel good, but I am doing it. Those are the ones who end up with the strongest cases with their bodies of evidence. No, it brings up that saying to me, you know, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. And there are different ways to do it. You know, whatever way that you want to um, gather your evidence, you can do it, you know, but just do it. Yeah. It can be helpful, as you said, when you have discrepancies later. And there's different ways, right? People use our family wizard, the parenting app. They have a parenting journal, any sort of online platform to record those important events or those phone calls, the exchanges right. when someone's late, when someone doesn't show up an agreement that was made that was gone back on, you know, when we're dealing, especially with parents who are, you know, high conflict and often have narcissistic tendencies and parts that, you know, protect them in those ways, that goalpost moves a lot. So when you're in active trauma and active custody case, it's hard to remember what you said when. And so it's good to have those notes just even for you to remember what you agreed to or what they agreed to. It's so helpful to have that done because that leads to then, you know, maintaining communication, right? That's our next point and our final point. It really helps because it it clears. It helps clear things because it can get yes. really cloudy. The clarity is important. This is where the real work is in turning around bias in the guardian ad litem, maintaining communication with them. One of the things that we get a lot, I know we had talked about Marley as one of our examples in the past, Marley, you know, I didn't even realize that she wasn't communicating with um, her guardian ad litem, but she, at one point, we were in a meeting one day and she said, it's amazing to me how often he's writing to her. And I said, you know, yeah, they do, they'll harass these people. It's unbelievable. And she said, well, I haven't heard from her at all. To which I asked her, well, when was the last time you wrote her? And she said, I've never written her. I've only had my first meeting with her. I started asking, around and um, a fair percentage of our clients were doing the same thing. After they had that first meeting, they then determined that the job was done. Now they just sat and waited. With the guardian ad litem, nothing can be further from the truth. So the work here is that you've got to respect boundaries. So what we always recommend, depending on the pace of your case, that you're either sending something every other week or once a month, right? If it's a very slow movie case, just send something once a month. If this case is very active every other week, sometimes we'll have a client where so much is going on that they'll even send a weekly, right? But we don't want to be eager to do that. And so we respect those boundaries, but we keep the lines of communication open with the GAL. And what we do in particular is we use a template for ongoing communication with the guardian ad litem. One of our um, custody blueprint templates is a particular way of writing to the GAL. And this is a big piece of turning around that bias. And what that template consists of is you're starting with letting them know what's going on with the children in different categories. Like, oh, here's what's going on with school. Here's what's going mm. on medically. They had a dentist appointment and there was one cavity and here's what we're doing. They were great with the x-rays. Here's what's going on socially. Here's what's going on with their religion. Whatever it might be, it's about starting your updates, however you do it, with the guardian ad litem by talking about the child, talking about the children and just updating them. And what you're doing there, the purpose of what you're doing there is you're basically saying, get to know my child. Here's what's going on with my child. And by way of that, you're indicating how strong a relationship you have with your child, with your children. The second part then, below that, it's not where you start or any incidents that have taken place over that past two weeks or month with your co-parent. It might have to do with parenting time. It might have to do with neglect or abuse. It might have to do with not keeping their word about helping them with their science project, whatever it might be. It might have to do with them starting an argument at an exchange. This is the guardian ad litem 
who's supposed to be watching over the children. And no matter how you feel about your guardian ad litem, you have to keep coming at them as if you have faith in them. You have to keep coming at them in a way where you are not just informing them about it in, in, to try to get their bias to be more towards you than your co-parent. You also need to hold them accountable. And the way you do that is with that information. But if you're emailing a guardian ad litem and saying, oh, you can't, he did this and he did that and he did this and he did that, it's not going to look good. So it has to start with, hey, the kids are doing great. They're doing this and they're doing that. This is going on and that's going on. This concern we had is cleared up in this way, this doctor, that doctor. Then you go into the whole, there are some concerns that I need to make you aware of. And you basically end with that. And the whole thing really does need to be bullet pointed out. Once you start writing in these paragraph forms, it becomes a narrative and it sounds emotional. You want it to sound very factual. Bullet point mm -hmm. medical, you know, Susie did this, Bobby did that, right? And then when you get down to the incidents, each incident is a bullet point said as briefly as possible. And that's where you hyperlink or attach the evidence for what you're saying. Because as I say to everybody about everything that you're talking about in your case, don't share it if you don't have evidence for it because then it's just hearsay and makes you look mm -hmm. like complaining and bad mouthing and mud slinging. Don't sling mud, just bring in facts, bring in evidence of actual facts. This isn't mud, this is actually what happened, right? And so that's really the crux. That's the biggest and best thing you can do to try to turn around the bias of the guardian ad litem towards you and barring that, holding them accountable for what you in writing have made them aware of. And if they ignore that and they put out a report or an investigation or something going the wrong way, you have a written record that the GAL knew about this. The GAL knew about that. And she never called in the kids and talked to them about it. She never included that in her report. She still thinks he's such a great dad. You need these bi-weekly or monthly updates to be very and very factual. Do not get emotional about any of it and put that out there. You know, you're reminding me of parts of us that are like, I call them the scientific parts. We have these protective parts that sort of act like scientists. They're really focused on knowledge, understanding, um, and they rely heavily on logic and rationale and Potentially, potentially, they can disregard emotional and subjective aspects. But I think in this case, that actually works in a person's favor, because if we can remain sort of objective, like overcoming bias requires recognizing the importance of emotional intelligence and having empathy and understanding there are different, different perspectives and diverse perspectives, right? So you said now when the, a parent may respond with, well, he did this and he did that, or they did this and they did that. That other parent has their own take, right? And has their own perspective. And we want that parent to be doing those types of things. We want our clients and our protective parents to really just presenting the facts and not bringing in, into that, you know, me against you sort of thing. So That's this right. is where those scientific -y parts, those scientific parts can just sort of analyze and collect all the data and really strive to balance intellectual curiosity with an emotional awareness to really promote the relationship that they have with the GAL as, in, as far as helping them make an unbiased decision when it comes to it, the ch when it comes to the children. So I was really just, as you were talking, I was like, oh, this is, you know, the gathering evidence is one thing, but if we could really sort of step into these observer scientific parts of us that are collecting it all, then that really helps to take sort of the emotion out. And the other thing I wanted to mention is oftentimes there'll, there's so much that our parents have to respond to. Um, it's important to respond promptly to the inquiries that are that are asked of them from the GAL. Is it not? Yeah, it's important. It is. It is. There's and you want to answer quickly while we, you know, when we talk about communication with our co-parent, we talk a lot about um, 
you know, not answering right away, not even reading things right away and kind of calendaring when you go into OFW talking parents, whatnot. But with a guardian ad litem, you really want to respond right away, even if it's with, oh, let me look into that for you, or let me try to gather that for you, or let me try to find out for you. Respond to that right away and then come back with a real answer within 24 hours if you can. And it's always, you know, it's always about under promising and over delivering, right? If they yeah. say, how, how quickly can you get this information to us? And you think it'll take you two or three days, say that you'll get it to them in a week because you don't know what's going to happen. Life happens and that slows you life, down a little life. bit. But to do that and then to give it to them instead of a week later, but to give it to them within the next three or four days is going to make you look like somebody who does, who delivers. And I want to speak quickly to, I love that you're talking about that scientist part of you because it makes me feel like when I'm recommending to clients, you know, instead of going in being a mom, pretend like you're the lawyer speaking for you, right? That changes people's language and that type mm -hmm. of thing. And, you know, for some moms, I think it kind of feels like, well, well, that'll just make me sound heartless or cold. But, you know, you talk, I hear you talking about that emotional bit. That emotional bit comes in when we talk about sort of the template for writing to the guardian ad litem. Um, that first part where you're talking about the children, you can, you're going to be factual, but that's where you add something delightful. Like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, you should have seen, I have a picture, I've been hatching a picture of how excited she was about the science project. We went out for ice cream afterwards and she got three scoops and it was amazing. You can add stuff like that without being huge. And I know I just said like, uh, you know, I just added 20 words to that bullet point as it were, but you don't have to choose all the examples I gave. You just want to add right. another five to eight words that show something emotional about what happened, right? Something where you're talking about your reaction and how delightful and the reward and the bond and the closeness and like five to eight words, you can add that. And, and it doesn't have to be in every bullet point either. You want things to have balance, but that's the kind of thing we recommend. And that's where that can show up so that you can really think more like a lawyer, especially more so when it gets to that second part where you're talking about the incidents and the things that are going on that you also have hyperlinked or attached evidence for. So yeah, you include the pictures of like, you guys are hugging at that graduation party. You're like, hugging or handing her an ice cream cone because she won the science fair you're you know holding her trophy for it. whatever it might be we want those emotional photos to be there to show you know and not a lot you know when i say that i'm, I'm gonna just remind myself that a, a lot of parents want to add seven or eight photos it is like one photo maybe two and the second photo should not be another one of just you with the child but you with or the child with a lot of peers and extended family so that you also continue to show how you are, are not isolating. You're not isolating your child. You'll never say that. Some things we don't say much of, but we show that we are doing the exact opposite. And so that's the way to put that emotional piece in, but then remind yourself to be a lawyer when it comes to explaining the, those incidents, right? And in this way, you're also showing the GAL that you're transparent and that you're invested in a positive outcome. You're starting out with the kids, you are talking about the incidents, but you're hoping, you know, that the GAL can kind of help with these things, even though most GALs have said, I'm not going to give you advice and I can't help out. I'm just here for this. I think it's still worth something to say. You know, I'm, I'm hoping you can help out with this or something like that, even knowing they can't so that they understand that, um, you're kind of helpless with what's going on. So the court needs to step in and do something about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that you're saying to show the whole, the like with the, the life, right? So show what the child's life is like when the child is with you. And you can do that with a couple of pictures here and there in different areas of their life. There's a saying we have in, in the trauma world where I'm working with a client and we'll say, you know, we call it PMAP, paint me a picture. And what our parents mm. are doing is that they're painting that picture that these people can't see otherwise. And so, yeah. yes, we have, you know, these protective parts in us that are perfectionists and we want to get it right. So update that part and we'll know, okay, a couple of pictures will help here and there. We have these organizing parts that are going to be super helpful in getting that and hyperlinking and using the templates. We've got, yes. um, helper parts that are part of that, that are, are sort of going, Hey, here's the paint picture. Look at that. 
And then also these scientific observer parts that can really sort of gather the data together. And those, if we have, I'm seeing a sort of a cluster of parts that really are helpful to overcoming bias in these situations. And if we lean more into those, those parts that are really sort of anxious, the mama bear, the defensive parts, the judgment parts, those can maybe take a backseat or sort of watch while these other parts of us really lean in to, pre to present this wonderful life that, that the child has with this protective parent. So I right. love that you said that. That's, that's huge. Um, let's shift gears real quick. There are you know, it's just some of the ways these that we just presented, right? These are just some of the ways to potentially navigate bias with the GAL. And we really want you to remember, those of you listening, that the GAL ultimately wants what's best for your children. That is what their job is to determine. Yeah. And that's, you know, our, our hope. We're not going to be... I don't think any of us are naive about the fact that there are the outliers who are not like mm -hmm. that. But if you go in with faith that it's not a big power trip for them, but instead they really are trying to figure things out. I think that's helpful. And I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's difficult for people because remember the person who you dated is not the person, the person who you married is not the person, you know, who you divorced. Um, and that person who wooed you and, um, you know, started a family with you, that is the person who the guardian ad litem is meeting. So we that's do have nice. to, some grace there and remember that they are being wooed. They are being love bombed in a more professional way most of the time. Um, but so then what we're really saying is that by, you know, for our clients, by what we're always saying is that by presenting themselves, by presenting yourself factually, positively, without all that mudslinging, and just collaboratively showing yourself to be collaborative, both with your um, co-parent and the guardian ad litem, then you can increase the chances of a fair and favorable recommendation. But again, you know, it really does come down to those, um, you know, biweekly or monthly updates as a way to um, keep keep them informed and knowing really what's what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's all we have for today, Renee. It was a lot. Yes, it is. Um, that is all for this week's episode of Courageous Custody. But before we go, thank you so much for joining us, whether live or on replay. We're so grateful to have helped in any way that we may have. Yeah, we've got some great takeaways for this week. We want to make sure that you send biweekly updates to your guardian of litem. Uh, focus on your kids, focus on the kids and make sure that you show evidence. Do not present anything that you don't have evidence to back up. So next week, we want you to join us at 7 p.m. Eastern here. We want you to like or follow or bookmark us so that you can get the notifications and not miss anything because what we are talking about might catch you just when you need it. And don't forget to check the comments to get a free copy of the court appearance prep list. And you can go to the custody blueprint dot com to learn about the different ways to get help in your case. And we do want you to leave your own comments about your experience with this topic and topics you'd like to see discussed here in the future. We get comments from you all all the time and we read every one. So wherever you are listening, remember you're not alone. Until next week, stay strong, stay informed and keep fighting for what matters most. Bye, everybody. Bye, Don't forget the outro.